How many of you uh, work for the DOD? How many of you um, are lawyers? All right, excellent. That's the most important answer we're looking for tonight. So my name is Scott Chambers, and I'm an assistant wargaming specialist with the Center for Applied Strategic Learning at the National Defense University. And we're going to talk a little bit about wargaming, its history, a little bit about some of the different ways uh, you can, different ways and places you can find wargaming today in the professional context, and a little bit about sort of some of the trends that we see in wargaming moving into the future. I'll let my other panelists introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Caitlin Jamison. I'm a wargaming assistant, same place. Uh, and I'm Ken Clegg. I'm the acting director for the Center for Applied Strategic Learning, uh, which is to say our wargaming center at the National Defense University. And since I don't have a perfect picture memory, how many people were here for our panel yesterday? All right, excellent. We can reuse most of our jokes. I'm sorry for the ones that you'll have to hear repeated. First off, the obligatory disclaimer. The views and opinions expressed here are our own and in no way reflect the views of the Center for Applied Strategic Learning, the National Defense University, the Department of Defense, or the United States government. So, how many of you have seen the classic 1980s film War Games? So, in a lot of ways, what you saw in parts of that movie was a war game. You were probably looking at that list that scrolled quickly through the screen, uh, and there's a great write-up somewhere of everybody trying to dissect what all of the scenario variants uh, might actually mean somewhere online. Um, but as you get down, you'll begin to see they get more and more complicated, and that's actually a pretty good uh, way to look at wargaming as a field and the span of what we consider it to be. My colleague, who unfortunately dislocated his knee and couldn't be here with us uh, for this panel, has a great phrase to describe the field of wargaming. Uh, they were having a discussion a number of years ago about what's the collective noun uh, for uh, wargaming centers of excellence. Everybody's naming them, uh, uh, calling themselves a center of excellence. And what do you call it when you have a group of them? So you have a dazzle of zebras, a herd of antelope, a parliament of owls. Murder of crows. Murder of crows, another great one. And he said, what, what's the collective now? An archipelago of wargaming, because we all sit on our own little islands and have evolved in our own ways to really perform kind of one task or type of game. So one of the things you'll see throughout this presentation is a lot of designs and techniques that are fit for a specific purpose and uh, often kind of evolve and develop in very different ways to achieve those uh, ends. So working can be a lot of different things. It can be tabletop map encounter uh, based games, some of the hex encounter games you might be familiar with. It can be something as simple as a facilitated discussion in the context of a scenario. It might be a role-playing decision-making exercise that could look anything like something that doesn't look too dissimilar to uh, Dungeons and Dragons to something that doesn't look too much unlike a model United Nations. Or can be a human in the loop computer simulation or a video game as it might be more commonly known. And that format depends on the sponsor's purpose and also very importantly the constraints on what they are able to do with the technology, resources, time, and people available to them. So what we're going to do is talk through briefly a little bit of the history of war games and wargaming where the field is today in a couple of the different ways it, ha it is uh, sort of interesting and notable today. Briefly kind of cover some of the trends in wargaming and then give you some information to get involved. We'll try to reserve a good chunk of this panel for Q&A because we really want to make sure we can talk about things that are interesting to you and not just us. Because speaking for I think all of us, we could talk about wargaming for a long time, probably much longer than you would like us to. So happy to kind of take those questions and steer the conversation where you're interested. So let's kind of start uh, way, way, way back. Wargaming can really kind of trace its earliest roots to some of the base uh, depictions of strategy and tactics that human society has evolved. Humans are naturally interested in play, and we bring that to all facets of our life, including warfare. And so games uh, originally like Shamat, Chess, Go, Viking Chess, if you've uh, seen that, are all good examples of early depictions of 
how humans tried to conceptualize strategy, often kind of very much showing their societal depictions of power, warfare, things like that, and put that into a game that would allow people to both learn about it and practice certain skills and ways of thinking. What this evolved into much, much later, in the early 1800s, uh, is really kind of where we can more closely trace modern day wargaming to uh, von Reiswitz's uh, Kriegspiel. You'll see a quote there from Karl von Muffling, the first Prussian chief of, the, uh, chief of general staff. It's not a game at all. It's training for war. I shall recommend it to the whole army. This was sort of your classic map boards with little pieces moving on them, um, you know, rulers to calculate distance and umpires giving uh, adjudication based on how many casualties each side is taking from exchanges of fire, how far can units move, and sort of dealing with a variety of other um, questions that might come up in gameplay. The most classic version of this is sort of three boards, one that just the red team can see, one that just the blue team can see, and each of them sees their forces and what those forces can see. And then an umpire's board, which is uh, controlled and has the entire map with all the forces in their actual positions on it. From that early 1800s uh, Kriegspiel, which was very much preparing tactical officers to command troops on the battlefield, maneuvering lines of uh, musketeers against each other, the field kind of continues to grow. And it reaches what a lot of people consider to be the heyday of wargaming at the, at the U.S. Naval War College between the First World War and the Second World War. There's a great quote, I'm not going to read the whole thing, from uh, Admiral Chester Nimitz, who was the commander of the Pacific Fleet uh, during the Second World War, that really gives a lot of credit to the wargaming done at the Naval War College in those about 20 years for building a shared understanding uh, of the problem that the U.S. was faced with in that war and how we could apply the tools that we had to that. These were large map board exercises, some of which lasted weeks uh, and could involve hundreds of officers playing um, everything down to individual ship captains in fleets of hundreds of vessels maneuvering against each other uh, on these huge, you'll see kind of one picture there if you can make it out uh, with kind of the glare of them on the giant uh, gridded floor map um, plane. Probably that was more a tactical engagement but they also played much higher strategic games that looked at the whole conduct of the war and actually really shaped American strategy. After World War II and the uh, invention of the atomic bomb, we, we as sort of a, a defense enterprise, really had to begin rethinking strategy. Uh, nuclear weapons forced a lot of changes to previously well understood doctrines and strategies. And one of the main ways that as people try to find tools that would let them understand how they can respond to this evolving strategic environment, wargaming was a big one. Um, uh, concepts like mutually assured destruction, a deeper understanding of things like deterrence signaling were things that evolved out of some of the early war games done in the 50s and 60s uh, by people, and you'll see some quote, a quote from him in the next couple of slides, like Thomas Schelling and Bernard Brody that looked at a lot of these issues. Um, one of the, uh, just kind of one anecdote, during the, some of the war, ga war games that were run in the 50s that looked at the questions of signaling, you would have two teams, uh, you know, a USSR and an American team that were taking sort of geostrategic, geo, uh, Paul Mill, political military moves against each other. Uh, sending ships places, putting bombers on different states of alert, um, all kinds of different diplomatic, military, economic signaling that they were doing. And the conversations that these groups were having were very detailed and, well, if we raise this regiment of bombers alert by this level, it will tell the Americans we're serious about this, but we're willing to concede on maybe this point. And I'm uh, very much paraphrasing. But what these games really showed is that when 
you looked at what the other team was discussing, what they saw the other team doing, there was often complete mismatches in understanding. And that was even in groups of people where both sides were Americans uh, playing these factions, not actually native uh, Russians or other Soviets. So from wargaming kind of growing from this very tactical Kriegspiel to the sort of operational strategic, the theater campaigns of the Naval War College to finally the very high level military strategic uh, work that was done during the Cold War, we're now seeing sort of the, uh, that period of time and right up, up to the modern day, we're seeing wargaming being used for more than just war. We'll talk about a number of these in the next couple of slides, but I just want to put out, point out this really long quote from Thomas Schelling, who's a Nobel Prize winner in economics. Um, I'll try to paraphrase it if you can't read it, but he was doing these uh, very Paul Mill uh, crisis games during the Cold War for the Kennedy administration, and actually had principals, uh, the vice president, uh, secretaries, secretary level, uh, people including the Attorney General, Robert Kennedy. And after he played in his first one of these crisis games, he went to Schelling and said, this is a phenomenal technique to look through problems and understand uh, different decision paths and strategies and trying to understand those. And he actually asked Schelling if he could begin trying to design a series of games to look at the question of uh, the strategy for desegregating the South uh, in, during the Civil Rights Movement. Unfortunately, a couple weeks later, that was in uh, Halloween of 63, a couple weeks later, uh, JFK died, and obviously that reshaped the administration's priorities at the time and Ken uh, Bobby Kennedy's role, but it really goes to show that somebody who had just come to this technique could immediately see ways to apply it to very different problem sets. With that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues to talk about some of those different problem sets. All right, so kind of moving on to war gaming today. Um, so who's using war games these days? Um, definitely the Department of Defense and uh, various parts of the military. Um, we've seen a little bit of a rise of war gaming in the intelligence community. Homeland Security, emergency management, FEMA does a lot of exercises. Um, policy makers, which Ken will speak to a little bit more, and also NGOs and private sector researchers. So what is war gaming used for today? Um, three main things. The first is research and analysis. And with war gaming and research, you don't just do the war game, pull data from it, and there's your answer because war games don't necessarily predict anything or hand you, you know, solutions or silver bullets for things. Um, but rather, when you're using war gaming and research, it kind of exists in this process of, um, you know, actually doing the research, collecting data, and then at testing that out in a war game, and then you continue on that loop. So, you know, your findings and lessons learned from the war game, you'll take back, do more research on, collect more data, and then maybe test it again in another war game. Um, education and training is a big one as well. Um, that's what we do um, at CASEL. Um, so, allowing students to take what they've learned in the classroom from lectures and readings and actually applying it um, in a scenario setting, low risk environment, um, where they can actually get, you know, hands-on experience actually applying what they've learned. And policy, once more, Ken will talk about. Um, all right, next slide. So one of the main topics that um, we're starting to turn to with wargaming is great power of competition, especially in the gray zone or <laughs> hybrid war, some call it. Um, so what is the gray zone or hybrid war? People define it different ways. It's kind of a loose definition. Um, so kind of the two main ones are basically things countries do to try and influence situations and conflicts just below the threshold of actual war and kinetic conflict. Um, the other um, is kind of countries using all of their instruments of power, their national instruments of power to affect things again below the actual conflict level. So. What does it look like? What are some of these things that countries could be doing in the gray zone? Um, influence and information operations. Um, maybe you're you know, using social media to try and change opinions of a population in a country. Um, political subversion and diplomatic efforts. Um, maybe, um, maybe a country is, uh, you know, 
speaking diplomatically to others, trying to get that uh, plausible deniability of things that they may, may be doing. Maybe they're sending agents into the field and starting protests in other countries um, to try and affect the stability of, of their target country. Um, also, military force posturing. Again, below the conflict threshold, um, great signaling, or um, maybe you're doing it kind of below the radar and sending unmarked soldiers into territories. Um, also, economic and energy leveraging. Maybe you have gas pipelines that run into a country and they do something you don't like, so you turn off the power to their country, um, or at least some of their access to it. But one of the key features here is you know, plausible deniability. Um, countries who are kind of doing these operations, being able to say, hey, I don't know what you're talking about. It's not us. You don't have any evidence of it. Um, so one of the, one of the great um, formats that we uh, tend to use for this kind of um, topic in wargaming is matrix gaming. And this is something that Scott mentioned earlier, the one that kind of looks similar to Dungeons and Dragons, um, but with a few differences. So first, it's a role-playing um, war game exercise, whatever you want to call it. Um, so players are playing different countries in whatever region that you happen to be looking at. And there's a lot of freedom of action in this format. So basically, if you can describe it, you can generally do it. Um, but there's a few differences. Um, first of all, uh, there's structured argumentation in this. So usually in D&D, &D you sit, are describing to the DM, hey, this is what I want to do. And then you have kind of a set of rules that govern how that will actually take place. Um, in matrix gaming, you go a little bit further than that. So you describe to the facilitator what you want to do, why you want to do it. So what is the effect that you are trying to achieve? And then you also have to argue why you will be successful. So give reasons why your action that you're taking will actually be able to take place um, and you'll achieve that effect that you want. Um, after the um, active player um, makes those arguments, it passes around the table to the other players, and they can argue either for or against the success of that action. Um, and then uh, the facilitator will say, okay, I've heard your arguments. Based on that, you have to meet a certain number on a dice roll in order for it to be successful. They roll the dice, and if it happens, um, it's then added to that narrative. So again, it's collective narrative building, just like in D&D, your players are adding to the scenario and how it's developing. So um, you also have a clear intent of action in the game, um, which can kind of, is one of those challenges, especially with um, gray zone warfare. Um, again, you have that plausible deniability in gray zone, but in a matrix game, everyone's sitting around the table, you are hearing exactly what they're saying and why they want to do it. So you have to kind of get the players on your side a little bit to say, hey, you know that that's happening, but um, you know, as a player, you know that's happening, but as the country that you're playing, you don't. Um, so you just have to work with the players on that. Next slide. So kind of a um, emerging topic in, in war gaming that's becoming more prevalent is climate change. Um, so variety of challenges in climate change and um, resource scarcity and things like that. Um, there's a couple different games out there. Um, I've just kind of highlighted um, two. One that I happened across called The Climate Game, and this is actually an online game that looks a lot like a board game. Um, so basically players are competing for harvesting natural resources um, while also facing the consequences of um, using those resources for production um, and also managing your income. So, and then another one is um, actually a game that I designed with one of my coworkers called Damned If You Do, and it looks at water scarcity in the Middle East and how that scarcity um, as a result of climate change could drive um, instability in the region, conflict with other countries, and also general, generally um, uh, relations between the countries. So, looking at this at the board, um, players, um, face droughts every year, they are assigned amount of water and they have to be able to manage it, um, assigning to municipal irrigation water. They have a hand of cards, um, so they can take different actions based on those cards. Um, so uh, classic board games are really great for climate change. It's worked really well. Um, so classic board games, you know, they have a rigid rule set. So with the uh, Damned If You Do game, we have a whole set of rules and it dictates it dictates exactly how uh, players interact with each other, um, how they interact with the game, and how many actions they can take, et cetera. Um, so designing the game, it was kind of a mechanics mashup. It's this weird crossover between uh, Battle for Hogwarts and Terraforming Mars. <laughs> um, 
And that came after a long process of testing out mechanics and getting inspiration from other sources. Um, so you could call it kind of a modified commercial game with you know two versions going on at the same time. But uh, board games are really great for um, educational games as well um, because you can just bring it to the classroom, set it up, and um, depending on the game, you can have a facilitator there just to help the students, but generally they will be able to carry on themselves um, in the game and learn from it and uh, just play it with or without help. Um, but having a facilitator there is always a good option too. So it has a lot of flexibility in the classroom. <coughs> Okay, so shifting to policy makers, um, Caitlin just mentioned, uh, particularly with board games, uh, how given a, a rigid rule set, uh, you can have a facilitator or not, um, depending on, on what you're trying to achieve. Um, I will refer back to the disclaimer that Scott mentioned at the beginning. Um, the words I'm about to say are my own, uh, and not the express opinion of anyone else. Um, you don't want to do that with policymakers, <laughs> right? You want to give them, even in a semi-rigid -rule, uh, rule set, uh, meaning there's processes by which they interact with each other, um, sometimes mirroring the real world. Uh, so uh, if you're dealing with US policymakers, you know, the, the interagency process, by the way, um, huge misnomer, there is no interagency. Um, it doesn't exist, there are no interagents and there are no badges. I keep trying to get one and they tell me they don't exist. Um, so if you have these real world people, you know, assistant secretaries, secretaries of, of departments, um, all the way up to and including the President of the United States, you don't really want to give them total free reign to do whatever they want. Um, for the record, that is not a political statement. Um, that's just good practice. Um, I've been doing this 17 years. I've never let any senior decision maker free with an exercise to run it the way that he or she wanted um, because they don't understand necessarily, no fault of their own, um, why the game is written that way. Um, exercises are written fundamentally, particularly for policymakers, to allow them the freedom of space to talk through wicked problems that aren't clear answers to in a safe space where you can say something that may or may not be entirely logical, ground in reality, or useful. Um, so everything we do at the National Defense University is um, under Chatham House rules or non-attribution. Um, but for example, uh, I'll, I'll give a couple quick, quick examples. Um, in 2003, yes, I've been there a long time, um, we were running a port security exercise and a uh, senior member of the, um, the government said, well, we'll just send the National Guard in to ring all the ports. That'll protect them. Yeah, except it was 2003. I think something else was going on after about March 30th or so. Um, it was called Iraq. Uh, let alone we were also in Afghanistan. And so how are you counting those people that are going to ring a port? What are they going to do? Who's paying for them? And there's about 12 other questions I have. That's why you have a facilitator to help bring out those answers. Because maybe there was a good logic behind <coughs> the thought, but it just wasn't developed enough. Um, and that's, again, fundamentally why you, you don't uh, let them play it themselves un, um, unmonitored, so to speak. Um, so before I get into the second one, you know, big picture, I, I try not to read slides, but for policymakers, it's really giving them an opportunity to get outside of their inbox, right? We're all busy. We all have an inbox that is somehow crushing us every single day. Um, I don't care what your, your profession is. This gets them to put their phones, their email, their tablets, their Blackberries, their iPhones, fill in the blank away for some period of time, hopefully, you know, not less than half a day. Um, although that happens a fair amount, um, where they can start talking, gain insights, um, think through logic, figure out where gaps and seams are in policies, 
um, funding, all sorts of, of things like that. Um, so to this day, uh, the best compliment I've received as a professional war gamer is uh, I had a member of Congress sitting in an exercise uh, dealing with bioterrorism. And after the event uh, concludes, he walks out of the, the game room and he goes to me, um, how do you sleep at night? And um, for the record, this is the only time I've ever lied to Congress uh, because I'm an insomniac. And I said, pretty damn well, why? And, uh, and he said, because you scared the shit out of me. Good. That was my job. What's your job? Um, we aren't as prepared as I think we should be for this. And so maybe we need some better legislation. Um, I inserted the question mark. There wasn't really a question mark, but the story's better if I tell it my way. Um, and so for me, the fact that I scared the shit out of him using his exact words um, really gives me the, um, the reason for why we do this. We do this so that, um, yeah, if, if you don't think about the unthinkable now, you're going to be doing it in the middle of a crisis. Trust me, that is a very, very bad way to do crisis management. Okay, so shifting um, from policy uh, gaming, which is what I was hired to do originally um, at, at Castle or its predecessor organization to business war gaming. Um, okay, I've got a few minutes left uh, before we turn to questions. Business war gaming is a unique field in and of itself. Um, there's a lot of challenges and risk involved. Um, not the least amount in when you're talking about risk being you're planning something for your business and what happens if your competitor finds out about it, right? And so um, a lot of businesses, um, banks, uh, large corporations, uh, breweries, do this in order to figure out how to better position themselves um, in their market, whatever that may be. The challenge though becomes, in a business sense, how do you frame it in a way that you're figuring out exactly what you're trying to achieve? Uh, so the example I give, I was um, approached by some friends who own a, a large brewery, um, about six, seven years ago, they were trying to become bi-coastal. Um, fixes their logistics issue, they can bring more of their specialty beers to market on both coasts. Things that prior, basically, only one coast was receiving. Um, and hey, you know, I know you do some gaming, is there any way you can do this for, for us and figure out how to, to do it? Um, so yes, an NDA was signed. Um, yes, I saw a lot of books on how they develop their, their brand, how they market their beer, how they manage their logistics. And what it really came down to for them was, while the project was, was running, um, outside of my normal day job, for the record, um, was it wasn't about the logistics. You know, moving something from point A to point B, they'd already figured that out on one coast. Um, for them, it was how do you take a beer that's only seen on one coast and brand that in a very particular way for a co the other coast, which drinks fundamentally different beers. Um, and so I think you're going to see more and more of that as we go through um, maybe the next three to ten years, um, not just with, with the beer industry, um, as long as ABB InBev doesn't buy everything up, um, but also other industries as well as they're, they're trying to figure out how to increase their market share and decrease their bottom line. Which leads me to um, talking about technology. I've got lots of opinions on technology. Um, I'll disclaim my bias is particularly in the professional wargaming field at the strategic level. Technology sucks, right? Things break. 
I don't want to run a complex simulation looking at a spread of a disease with senior members of the US government and the computer crashes. I'll run that behind the curtain and give them the output. So as we're looking at the future of wargaming, um, you know, a, a lot of people are spending a lot of time and frankly money on, ooh, let's talk about AR, VR, XR, um, whatever comes after XR. And that's great. It's really good at the tactical. It's pretty decent right now at the operational. It sucks at the strategic. Um, there is no effective simulation out there, um, and I welcome anyone to try to prove me wrong, um, truly, um, because I'll try to find a way to buy it if, if it exists. But there is no good strategic level national or international simulation that can tell me how a country or the people that run a country are going to react to anything else in the world as it's happening natural, man-made, non-man-made, terrorist, government-led, I don't care what. We don't have the ability to simulate that. But I would be remiss if I didn't say, if this is your field, keep going. Believe me, if you find that solution for us, you will be a multimillionaire overnight. The US government will hire you um, don't take the job, take the contractor gig. Um, you'll actually keep all your money for you. Um, but uh, again, at the operational and the tactical level, it's really important what you're doing um, and, and keep doing the, the good work. I'll shut up there. So <clears throat> to kind of continue looking at some different elements of the future of war gaming, one of the things we're really seeing, and we touched on this a little bit, is that the topics that we're gaming are changing. A little bit of how we're actually doing the gaming is changing, but also what people are interested in seeing. We're seeing a real resurgence for the first time since really the end of the Cold War in actual great power competition between nation states and sort of the high intensity combat that may result from that. As Caitlin kind of mentioned, there is this upswing in interest in, you know, how do you gain gray zone and hybrid warfare? Because, on the one hand, we know how to game great power competition. Mind you, it's gotten a lot more complicated with cyber, space, uh, information operations, and just how impacted um, really the modern economic and infrastructure systems are by high-intensity conflict. But that stuff, that takes a lot of work, but we can figure out. There's a lot of people who see the methodologies that we would apply to that type of combat um, and don't really see how they can adapt that to gray zone and hybrid warfare. Part of that is because of the role cyber now plays in all sectors and all level of operations. Um, and another is, you know, on the one hand, how do we use artificial intelligence and machine learning to actually conduct the game do we have a AI behind the curtain um, modeling certain decisions or the uh, reactions of the populace? But then we also need to look at it from in the war game where you have two nation state militaries fighting each other. How does that now look different if those nations are using AI or machine learning enabled weapons, weapon systems or decision making tools? And also just how do you game that from a design point, too? Right. And then the last thing I want to say is we're also seeing some interesting uh, conversations within our field about the techniques and the methods and how the field tries to balance that. Um, to boil things down immensely, to allow me to say it in one or two minutes, there are two growing camps in wargaming that aren't always opposed to each other, and there's a lot that they can take from each other and use even in each other's very different types of games. But on the one hand, you have certain people who are trying to find ways to refine Wargaming's analytic validity, to make it a more um, 
you'll never get a completely precise answer from a war game, as, as Caitlin mentioned. We're looking to gather insights. But how can we make sure those insights are valid and meaningful? And how can we get the most out of a war game? And so one of the things that we're seeing come back into vogue, and this isn't a new idea, Peter Perla uh, coined it uh, much earlier, is this idea of the cycle of research of you use war games to look at things in the human decision-making realm. You use your live exercises, people actually running around a forest with laser tag guns to look at how, how are these tools, these weapon systems, these tactics, these ideas playing out in reality. And then you, when you actually have data on something, that's when you reply, actually apply your traditional quantitative analytic techniques, your operations research techniques, and you feed all of those different pieces of data between each other to some, some of these methods will pose questions that only the other tools can answer. Um, and that this is really something that's coming back into vogue and is uh, really kind of driving the community to have some interesting discussions internally. On the other end of the spectrum, you have advocates that are, that are really beginning to kind of uh, take from what the other, the rest of the field of game design uh, in the commercial world that is really saying humans are narratively driven. We like stories. It fits with us. And we attach and become immersed when we have a story, which in a lot of cases will make for a good game. And that doesn't just apply in the commercial side, but we have a growing body of people finding ways to leverage those same kind of narrative techniques, narrative analysis in the wargaming field. So. If these are things that interest you at all, here's a few resources where you can go to learn a little bit more. It might be hard to see the blue text on a black background, so happy to leave this up and you can uh, come up and look at it after the presentation. Uh, the first is a great blog run by a professor out of McGill University, Rex Bryden, called Pax Sims. Uh, it's a phenomenal website that really kind of lets you stay up to date in what's going on in the wargaming field. Best professional resource out there, and it will really connect you to a lot of the other things out there. If you want an in-person experience, check out the Connections Interdisciplinary Wargaming Conference. This summer, it will be in Quantico, Virginia from August 3rd through the 7th. It's free and open to the public, um, provided you register, and really is a chance to bring together the commercial, the academic, the hobby, and the professional wargaming community to share ideas, topics, and knowledge. And lastly, if you aren't completely bored of us, you can learn more about us at uh, that website. So with that, we'd like to turn the rest of the panel over uh, to a kind of open Q&A to kind of talk about whatever interests you in wargaming. Uh, this is my mandatory DOD, uh, you died a PowerPoint. So, what kind of questions do you all have? Yeah. I guess when you're doing, uh, when you're trying to, I guess, figure out a scenario, things are So, uh, for anybody that wasn't able to hear, kind of a question about, you know, scenarios might be derived uh, statistically or robotically. How do you account for human, uh, human decision making in that? So, I'll say I come from a history and poli-sci background, and I very rarely use statistics in my day-to-day -day job. Uh, most all of what we do is, and I'm speaking very much for myself, and I'll let my colleagues also kind of chime in, but a lot of it is all qualitatively driven, especially at the level we're kind of talking at the uh, sort of high operational and strategic level. We are fundamentally interested in that question of human decision making and kind of trying to derive our scenarios quantitatively is something that really isn't really a technique that we use at all. So I'll say, um, echo Scott, you know, most of what we do is focused on human decision making. Um, how I've used it before, so I mentioned the, the bioterror game. Um, I actually found a, a model um, that it was a US government owned model uh, to look at a spread of a disease. Um, what it didn't do well is it didn't take anything from the aggregate, you know, a million people died, I'm just pulling a number out of my backside, um, and then say, okay, 
a million people died in the US, but where is that population spread? Um, so if you actually look at the data, you know, I ran it in the background, I then applied some basic logic to it. Uh, a higher populated state uh, tended to have a higher impact. So if you wanted to avoid um, this disease, you're pretty good shape if you're in Montana. Um, you're in less good shape if you're in California. It's, um, sometimes you have to take a representative number um, to, to meet the need um, to, to facilitate the discussion. Yeah, I was gonna say, um, we don't really include a whole lot of data or statistics in our scenario or in participant guides that we hand out or anything like that. Um, luckily for us, we generally work at the unclassified level, and if you're working with data, it's probably classified. Um, so um, a lot of time for our games, we do have to include information like that. Um, we'll usually abstract it somehow or just kind of like adapt it as necessary. And generally, like when you abstract something like that, it tends to remove the human error pretty well. So it works out. Yeah, up here in the front. So I was what are some, what are some books to look into or some fields to study if you want to become a better strategic planner? Great question. So how, what are some areas and tools you can use to become a better strategic thinker? Um, being very biased, there's a lot of great games out there um, that can help you think kind of on a broader and more uh, systematically, whether, and really kind of it's finding the, the game that you're interested enough to kind of play enough to build that understanding and uh, um, sort of broad thought. Um, for me, at least, that's Europa Universalis, but I'm kind of... Yeah, I mean, gaming in general is great because instead of just reading about it, you're actually doing it and like honing that skill. And then I think another good resource, um, it's on my reading list right now, so I can't like speak to it super well, but there's this book called Thinking Fast and Slow, and it's gotten pretty great reviews. Yeah, that's a good book. Um, so uh, a couple of thoughts, and uh, at least, Scott, you'll, you'll think this is ironic coming out of, of me. Um, from a strategic thinking and, and framing the problem perspective, um, the, the US Department of Defense has a joint publication 5-0. Um, I've railed against it uh, for a long time, uh, which is why Scott thinks what I'm about to say is ironic. Um, but it was recently rewritten, and what it does is it defines the process by which at least DOD thinks through a strategic problem, you know, the, the steps along the way to come up to, to a solution. Um, it's interesting, it's short, it's unclassified, you can download it pretty easily. Um, what I think it does well is it frames the process. What I think it does less well is frame the actual way systems dynamics works in the human brain. Um, let alone multiple human brains or a network of, of brains. Um, the other thing that, that I always drive people back to is um, there's several books on leadership uh, that I think help frame some of, of strategic thinking. Uh, Simon Sinek, S-I-N-E-K, I believe, um, wrote uh, several books. Uh, the one I like best for thinking about why we're doing things, uh, which is the fundamental challenge of strategery, is uh, start with why. And then one more um, that just came to mind. Um, so I actually took a geostrategic thought class in college, and um, we read this article. I wish I could remember the exact name of it, but it was from Henry Kissinger's book called um, Diplomacy. And um, if you want kind of a historical perspective of strategic thought and kind of what was going through or what seemed to be going through leaders' minds, um, there's a great article in Diplomacy um, about um, kind of Stalin's calculations during the World War. So that's also a great one. Um, Diplomacy by Henry Kissinger. It's a collection of articles. And then there's one in there about Stalin's thought process and kind of how he flips sides and things like that. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. 
you said Simon? Cynic, S-I-N-E-K, I believe. Uh, start with Y. So the question was, when we're gaming with senior policymakers, how do we account for that? And, and I, you've really hit on a great, great question of uh, those pe people at that level don't work 24/7 on the problem that your game might be on in the in the real world. So how do you account for the fact that they're only putting a small amount of their time thinking about that issue? So I'll give you kind of two answers uh, here. One is for most of the games we do as sort of senior policymakers, we are trying to be the opposite for them, giving them a dedicated chunk of time to do a deep think on a specific issue or challenge. Um, and so that isn't meant to capture the way they think about a real strategic challenge and sort of refine that or capture that. It's meant to use their knowledge, their decision-making processes, and their thoughts to better understand or help solve an issue. Um, the second kind of answer is, in a lot of that gaming in the 50s and 60s, when they had games that would involve the principals level or people playing uh, principals, and by principals I mean uh, president, secretary of defense, um, sort of the very senior level of decision-makers, they would only have them come in for very brief chunks of the game to get briefed, make a couple of decisions, and then push them out the room and let everything else kind of occur. Kind of like yeah, so I'll give a couple quick examples. Um, there's no substitution for time, right? But just like everyone in the real world, time is, is a finite object um, as we at least understand it. And so, um, I used to run a program that brought together uh, sitting members of Congress uh, with sitting executive branch officials, um, long history, but what we had to do for them was unique, which is why I bring it up. I actually worked with the Speaker's office, um, the Speaker of the House's office, to roll votes. So no votes could be called during one of my exercises. Um, in my eight years, as part of that program before I shuttered it. Um, we had a procedural vote called one time, procedural votes cannot be stopped. And I got the first phone call. Quite literally, I got the first phone call. I got the call before pagers went off. And I got everyone back on a bus. I stopped an assistant secretary mid-sentence and got every uh, member of the house back up to vote uh, in time. So you have to go through a lot of extra steps sometimes um, that way. The other way we've run exercises for very senior officials, um, this one including uh, a former president, um, we went over to his house, so to speak, uh, and worked in the East Wing on a Saturday from you know 8 a.m. to noon or whatever it was and he was scheduled in for two hours. Uh, so in the beginning, you get your other people prepared, talking, figure out a solution. Uh, the president comes in, gives his thoughts and advice, he gets feedback, and then he walked out, and then the game continued um, based upon his guidance. Uh, so there, that's all to say, when you're dealing with senior policymakers, you have to attack it a different way and you have to think about their time um, first and foremost but what I've found over time uh, not to overuse that word is they're willing to give it to you if you get them like that if they have to think too hard to get immersed in the game you've lost them they're gonna walk away they'll never come back any other questions yeah uh, back aisle how do you uh, account for a 
let's say, technological variables for which there's no performative data? Great question. Uh, how do we account for technology that we don't have data on? Uh, short answer is that's not really the type of gaming we most frequently do. Um, the sort of data-driven tactical gaming that I think you're, you might be thinking of uh, tends to be done more by sort of the service, uh, research labs, or places like that. Um, and in short, they make up numbers. Um, obviously, I don't work there, so I can't speak to any specific uh, ways they do that. But extrapolating from data they currently have, talking to their uh, scientists and subject matter experts on those technologies, um, and then really kind of figuring out, depending on the purpose of the, So this all gets back to the purpose of the game. If the purpose of the game is to test, well, how dangerous would this system be to our strategy and our uh, standard operating procedure, well, then you're going to make that system very dangerous to figure out how it affects your tactics. If you want to figure out, well, how effective is this system we want to use and how much will it contribute to our success, well, you don't, probably want, you don't want to probably give it an accuracy of 100% because then, of course, the answer is going to be, wow, this was really effective. Um, so it, it goes a lot back to what is the purpose of doing the game and what role does that technology play in that game. Yeah, a, a concrete example. Um, a, a customer years ago, we ran some data for them um, because there was a, a quantitative... Um, set of variables that they wanted to look at and frankly the numbers were much higher than they wanted them to be and well you have to dumb that down take it down to, to 2% um, yeah no um, I don't do that uh, it's not good business to um, plan for the best there was a article by a woman years ago um, who I generally think very highly of, I won't name her here, uh, but she basically was railing against the resurgence of gaming within the Department of Homeland Security in 2003 to 2006 or 7. Um, they still do a lot of it now, but that was when she was operating in the, in the field. Um, and her basic premise was, well, we always plan for the worst, but the worst never happens. Um, sure. Valid enough point, but um, doesn't mean you plan for the best because then you're screwed later, right? Um, so we look at historical examples. If you're looking at um, the release of Plague, uh, you know, I go back to Sverdlovsk. It was an 86-ish percent mortality rate. I'm going to use 86 percent. If the numbers are too high, I might go down to 84 um, percent. There, sorry. Uh, there's there's the problem with numbers, though, um, particularly with death, people shut down when the number is too high. Seven million people just died. Oh, crap, I lost the game. Oops. Restart. Um, so you have to, to think a little bit that way, but, but if you dumb it down to a point where it's so watered down and 12 people die, there's no point in running it. Again, abstraction is a wonderful tool in game and exercise design, and um, especially when we're gaming topics like cyber and things like that, if we don't have the exact data on those technologies, um, we can also just focus on the effects of it, especially um, at the strategic level. And it's like you may not know exactly how it works, um, but you know the effect um, that you can probably get out of it. And then that's the part that you game. Great. Yeah. Based on like you guys get hired by different companies to do different things, but the type of people playing the games might give you very different results. Like you run a yeah. war game, but you have like a hospital administrator, and then you have like somebody that's a senator. Like how do you mm -hmm. extract like, the data from the, the two different groups? Fantastic question. Um, short answer: It's going to be in completely uninspiring. Um, we don't. Um, <laughs> The the challenge is because most of our 80-ish exercises a year that we conduct um, are bespoke, we run them one time. Um, the N is really bad when it's one. Um, so interpretation and analysis is, is loose at best. 
Um, what we try to do is we try to capture the salient discussion points and then maybe seed. Um, NDU does not take policy, um, a policy position on anything. We're an educational institution. But we might feed in some thought about, there was a lot of discussion about fill in the blank. Maybe you need to think more about fill in the blank. Um, and, and that's how we, we manage that. For things that we do have a higher N on, um, we can show some trends over time. But again, at the strategic level in particular, um, games don't prove things. So I don't worry about it too much. Yeah. Middle here. I'm sorry, uh, what sort of things do you have a bigger N on? Um, so the, the most recent uh, series I've been working on uh, is with some international partners, thank you, um, that looks at gray zone. Uh, and so the N on that one is five, um, but the other piece of the, uh, the um, analysis is all five were based on the big picture, same thing, but at the micro level had different scenario elements based on the geography around that region, um, and at least 50% of the players were different. The reason we had different players, in particular for a st statistical analysis, um, uh, was we weren't so interested in the statistics but the trends, and because it was part of a larger analytical framework, uh, we had the authors of a study or the study or series of studies uh, across those five um, participating in the exercise as a, as a baseline to, to get them to have a common frame of reference for their writing. All right, we'll try to take a few more questions quickly. Yeah. I was kind of wondering on the, uh, like, the impact of like, the scale of the game kind of has. Uh, like, is there a diminishing return on if you have more players less they get out of it, or is there like a peak point that it gets worse and worse? <laughs> So the, 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 short and, the short and disappointing yes. answer is it depends. Uh, you know, there are great games that are run with, you know, dozens, scores, even hundreds of players that get data, useful, valuable, interesting data, and often valuable and interesting learning out of them. But it's all about the purpose. If you want to model a National Security Council level deliberation, you need a dozen people to do that. And having more, you're right, would be a diminishing return. If I want to model the joint, the, you know, across the Department of Defense strategic planning process with the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marine Corps, the Joint Staff, the Office of Secretary of Defense, and all the COCOMs having input into a strategic decision, I'm going to need people representing all of those. It's going to have to be bigger. And also just having enough people to interact with each other in a game that size as well. Yeah. In the front. Are there any examples of... Huh. This other party made a really weird decision. Can we reverse engineer their processes or motivations mm. That's a fantastic question. You can tell by our silence. Yeah. Um, so I think the closest I can get to it is um, we usually bump into this, I think, mostly in playtesting. Um, for, for those that weren't here yesterday, Caitlin mentioned in, in her part about playtesting, um, you know, an A team, a B team, and a break the game team. Uh, the break the game team is, is generally where you're going to get that, huh? I didn't think anyone was going to ever do that. Um, I'm going to set off a tactical nuclear device to th show someone else that I mean business, where in my own territorial water, Okay, um, that's a thought, I'll let you do it, um, but why? And so then you have to go back, you know, if you were in that sort of a situation where you'd have to go back and go, okay, what allowed them to actually do that? But that's, I think, mostly where we'd run into that sort of thing. Yeah, good question though. Any other kind of questions? One, yep. Uh, going back to your idea about you know, great power competition and also parroting your work is since you're trying to model human behaviors, but that takes into strategic cultures, things like that. Do you, ever, do you ever actually look at, like, let's face it, how do the Chinese do this? How do they work? How do they 
test and train their own people to, to solve these same kind yeah. of policy and problems? So, uh, I'll plug the Connections Conference. We had a panel on that last uh, last year um, up at the Army War College. Um, and it's tougher for us because figuring out how closed societies like North Korea, Russia, China, Iran, war game is much harder than them figuring out because they can come to a panel like this and hear us talk um, about how the, at least how our little corner of DOD war games really isn't quite that level of information for us on the other side. But that's something I would dearly love to know more information about. Um, I think that's about all the time we have for questions, but what I will say is all of us are going to be around here. We'll try to punch out of the room so we can let the other panelists get here, but we'll be outside and happy to answer any other kind of questions we didn't get to or uh, just chat. <coughs> Thank you all for coming out tonight. Have a great rest of MAGFest.